So good afternoon, leaders. Welcome to a very, very special uh, leadership series. We have got um, a very, very special guest uh, today. We are talking about um, business during and after Omnicom. What's next? What's happening now? What you guys need to know? So we've got probably Australia's leading expert, medical expert, Dr. Norman Swan, Swan joining us. He's from Tonic Health and one of our newest, um, newest partners. So just to give a bit of overview, and forgive me, I've made a few notes here, but uh, Dr. Norman's a multi-award-winning broadcaster and journalist. He started as a physician uh, before moving into journalism, but before moving into, into Tonic Health and starting that. He's been the face of Australia's ABC um, analytics and medical aspects, so he's on all moving aspects of, of the ABC. He's Australia's most recognisable uh, and trusted voices, particularly um, uh, when it comes to medical. He's also hosted Australia's, hosts Australia's number one um, uh, uh, top rating podcast, uh, Coronacast, which he just finished recording and then realised he didn't press the record button. Um, and he's a regular on 7.30 report, the news breakfast show, uh, the project, Four Corners and ABC, but to name but a few. Uh, founder of Tonic Health, uh, who's a proud supporter of the IMAA family. And uh, I'm going to hand over to him. But before I do any questions, guys, either just wait till the end or put it in the chat feature and then I can ask him at the end, ask what you guys need to know. This is a very, very uh, special and important session. So I will uh, be quiet and hand over to, to Dr. Norman Swan. Thanks, Sam. And please just ask questions whenever they occur to you and we'll get to them later because I'll. I find the value of these sections, sessions is as much what you draw away, draw from me that's specific to your needs. So please don't hesitate and don't uh, don't hold back. And I can't, I'm, I'm sure I don't need to tell this audience to do that. So thanks very much for having me. Um, I'd like to acknowledge country. Um, I'm speaking from Gadigal land, uh, which is part of the Eora nation. Um, and I want to pay my respects to the elders who lead Aboriginal communities, past elders, present elders, and most important of all, uh, future elders. Um, and the best things, and I'd like to pay more respects to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people uh, joining us uh, today. Um, we at Tonic have learned a lot by having our parallel network, uh, Aboriginal Health Television, um, and really learning to be sensitive to, culturally sensitive to Aboriginal communities. We've also, I also want to pay my respect to Aboriginal communities who've really done it tough um, in, the, in this last year of the pandemic. Um, managed to keep it out of Aboriginal communities in 20, 2020, 2021. Really, some of them have done it very tough indeed in Northern Territory, Western New South Wales. And I think you'll find that when it gets into Western Australia, West Australia will not necessarily do that well. Um, so let me, let me move on to um, where are we now? Um, so unless you've been living in a bunker, probably most of you have already had COVID by now. Um, I mean, I've been reporting on COVID now since it began. And I went a long time before I knew anybody who had COVID. And you were probably the same. And since December, we probably are overwhelmed by the number of people we know of COVID and probably had it ourselves. Some of us have been in ISO. I certainly have for, um, it ended up being about 10 days. Um, so I just want to describe the evolution of the virus and, and where it's come from so you get a sense of where the next one will come from. So there will be another one. The question is, whether, will it matter that there's another one? Uh, the, one of the most common misconceptions about new variants is that a new variant evolves from the last variant. So that there's a variant, it kind of, it's kind of a build process. You get this mutation on top of mutations on top of mutations. That's actually not what happens. What happens is that they appear fairly randomly usually from low-income countries with low rates of vaccination, where they've also got people who are immunocompromised, often with HIV. It can actually happen in rich countries too when you've got immunocompromised people. And what's thought to happen is the virus gets into somebody who's not got a well-functioning immune system and it stays there for a long time and multiplies in the body and it actually mutates inside the person. And because they don't have a very good antibody response, the virus learns to evade the immunity of that person. And it can just start in a single person and then jump from there to other people. Um, and it's thought that process could take several months. Um, and I say it's more likely to happen in low-income countries because you've got large amounts of virus circulating. So the next 
variant will not be son of Omicron. Well, by the way, you probably saw the headlines last week, but son of Omicron, you know, already there's a new variant out. And that was really not um, an accurate description. I mean, God forbid that I should criticize my colleagues in the media because it's a great headline, son or daughter of Omicron. But in fact, what happened was, um, in a sense, there was a mummy virus, which was the, the virus that gave birth to Omicron. And nobody knows where that came from, probably South Africa. And it gave birth to three baby viruses, BA1, it sounds like, you know, bananas and pajamas, BA1, BA2, and BA3. And BA1 is the Omicron virus that we know um, that spread from su Southern Africa, around the world to Australia and so on. And then there's this BA2 around, which is really um, spawned from the same mother virus. So it's not spawning from Omicron, it's come from the mother virus, if you like. And it's a bit more contagious and probably more immune evasive, but not more virulent. And in some countries, it's, it's pushed out BA1. Um, Denmark being one country, Britain probably, America, it seems to be growing. You don't hear very much about BA2 now because it's, it's, it's not a serious threat. Um, Omicron has been labeled a mild virus. It's actually not a mild virus. It's um, milder than Delta, which is good news. But the variants that have appeared since the Wuhan virus, the one that started in China, or thought to start in China, um, the variants that appeared after that were more virulent, were more dangerous. And what's happened is Omicron has probably gone back to about the same virulence as the Wuhan virus. So if you remember rightly, the Wuhan virus, they let it rip in Britain. 45,000 people died by June 2020 for letting it rip. Look what happened in the United States and the tens of thousands of people died there. So Omicron is not a mild virus. And that's why you're seeing deaths and you're continuing to see deaths in um, people who haven't had their third booster and so on. So the features of Omicron are contagious, it's evaded the immune system and so much that everybody became vulnerable to at least an infection with Omicron, but not severe disease. So the rate of hospitalization, the rate of ICU, the rate of death has been lower, but because it's so many times more contagious, we've had so many more cases, we've had an unprecedented number of deaths. So the politicians love to talk about rates, but if your loved one has died uh, and they're not all over 80, you know, people in their 50s dying, um, if they're, um, you know, try telling them the death rate is low. Um, the death rate is significant uh, in terms of the numbers of people infected. Now, we got overwhelmed with testing. So we don't really know how many cases there are. Certainly when they were doing testing, we were underestimating probably by a factor of 10. So millions of Australians have actually been infected. They say, you know, the official numbers are one or two million, but in fact, it's probably at least five times that, could be seven to 10 times that uh, in terms of the numbers. So a lot of Australians have been immunized, have been, like, have been infected. So you tend to know what's happening because of the flow through to hospitalizations. And back in January, you know, we knew we had a pandemic on our hands because of the hospitalizations as much as the testing. And as, as hospitalizations start to fall off, you kind of know that the, 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 the funnel um, is, 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 is emptying out and, and the hospitalizations are the first sign of that, then ICU, and then deaths will eventually um, become lower. But Omicron will, will still be around and circulating, which is what the West Australians know, where they're nervous to actually open up their borders. Um, the, and, what, and we've gone from a country with almost none to, you know, some countries have red alerts out against Australians, America being one country. So where do we go from here? And I want to come back to rat testing and PCR testing, because I think that's relevant to the office situation. The international modeling, uh, and I had this on my show, the health report a couple of weeks, last, not, not this Monday, but last Monday, and you could look it up, Professor Chris Murray, and it's probably quite a good thing to maybe inform your HR people if you've got an HR group, but uh, what's going on. So the, the international modeling suggests that there will be a lull because so many people will have been infected by Omicron and vaccinated. <clears throat> and that lull will start probably from, you know, the international lull will start 
probably starting around about now, mid-February. By the end of March, more than 50% of the world's population will be effect, infected by Omicron. And uh, then there will be a lull because there's not many more people to be infected until a new variant comes along. I'll come back to new variants in a minute. Now, that's the Northern Hemisphere because they're going into summer. Um, Australia will be going into winter and we could see a second spike of Omicron, which probably won't matter that much because we've experienced Omicron before. Now, what Omicron gives you, I, get, I often get asked, well, is it good to, why, why would we get vaccinated? Just let's get the natural infection or why would you get a booster? Let's just get the natural infection and that gives us this natural booster. The Omicron virus, so you get infected with the Omicron virus, let's say you get infected with BA1 and BA2 comes along, you're going to be covered against BA2. So the Omicron family is what you're immune to. It doesn't look as though it gives you very good immunity to other variants when they've tested the other variants in the laboratory. So it's a pretty narrow um, immunity that you get with natural infection to Omicron. It goes fairly deep. But nonetheless, it's pretty narrow. It's not that it gives you no, no immunity to anything else, but it's not as good as you might think, which is why uh, you need a booster. If you've not had your booster and you've had the infection, you need to get your booster. As soon as you're well, free of symptoms, go and get the booster. Often asked, which is the best booster? Moderna, um, without question of doubt. It's, a, it's not a huge amount better than Pfizer, but it's significantly better. So if you can get Moderna, uh, get Moderna as your booster if you haven't already. Um, and the vaccine gives you a broader range of immunity. Now, if you got Omicron on top of that, your vaccination status, whether that be double or triple vaccine, vaccinated. by the way, the, the third vaccine is not a booster. It's a complete misnomer. These, we all, these, this is the third dose that you always needed to have. It's just that when they first developed these vaccines, they were obsessed, quite rightly, with safety and do they work. And what was cut short was their ability to work out what is the right dose and how many doses should you have. If they'd had time, all these vaccines would be three dose vaccines. And in fact, it's interesting, they're now developing the vaccine for six month olds to five year olds, and they're realizing that needs to be a triple vaccine. And, and of course, babies do get triple vaccines. They get triple antigen, they get the hepatitis B and so on. So we're used to three dose vaccines. So this is the third dose you always needed to have. Now, if you got Omicron on top of the vaccination, of vaccination, then that does stimulate a bit of a more broad, a, a broader level of immunity um, than just getting the natural in infection. It's incredibly complicated, but um, if you've not been vaccinated, you don't particularly want to go out and uh, and get this. I, I mean, I know somebody who had a single vaccine and died in Australia in the northern beaches of Sydney. Actually, a doctor. Um, so that's kind of the story with vaccination. I get asked, should we have a fourth booster like Israel? And your staff might be asking that as well. Um, look, this is really controversial. And at the moment, there's no evidence that we really need a fourth booster unless you're immunocompromised. So if you're immunocompromised, cancer chemotherapy, radiation therapy, um, HIV that's poorly controlled, um, organ transplantation or autoimmune disease where you're on strong medication to sort of suppress your immunity, then you do need a fourth dose. And you need a fourth dose about three months after your last, uh, after your last, after your third dose. And that does get you up there. Now, people who have had organ transplants are probably still not that well covered. So if you've got people in the office who've had kidney transplants or um, it will be mostly kidney transplant. You might have some people who have had heart and lung, but mostly mostly kidney, um, then they may not get a very good immune response even to the fourth one. And AstraZeneca has developed this monoclonal antibody drug. It's, it's, two, it's two antibodies that attack the coronavirus. And it's good for Omicron as well. And it's a single dose that lasts a year and gives you the sort of immunity that a vaccine gives you. And it's designed for immunocompromised people. And I think that's had provisional approval in Australia. Now, people, the, the international modeling suggests that even if we've got a new variant coming out in the months to come, we're still going to be okay. And the reason is, that while Omicron 
infection it doesn't give you great immunity it gives you some uh, we've got a lot more and more people around the world including low-income countries who'll be vaccinated and so we'll be pretty well resistant to severe infection at least for a while unless it, unless there's a big jump in in immune evas evasiveness i'll come back to, i'll talk about that now for a new variant to emerge it's got to be more contagious than the previous one otherwise it'll just you know the other one will muscle it out virulence which is how dangerous it is is entirely independent of contagiousness so people so again the government's done the, really not done a good job here they've kind of assumed that a community here said we're going to go endemic they use this a magic word endemic as if the virus becomes harmless and the natural evolution is to a less dangerous virus that is complete bullshit and the virus is already endemic because it's everywhere around the world now smallpox was endemic and it killed people polio was endemic killed people um, malaria is endemic kills people influenza is endemic kills a lot of people endemic does not equal mild and virulence is a separate entity for, genetically from contagiousness so it will be more contagious and in order to be more contagious in a world where people have been exposed to the virus or been vaccinated it's going to have to evade the immune system and so and this is evolution at work and therefore we'll get another surge of people being infected who've already had COVID or who have already had the vaccination. So the question then is, will it be more severe? And we don't know that answer. That's kind of a random thing, whether it's more severe. It's not in the virus interest to kill, to have a high death rate because it doesn't get passed on. The thing that saved us from MERS, the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, which is another coronavirus, is that it kills 30% of people who get it and therefore is not, does not have strong pandemic potential. But, you know, if it goes up to 10%, 8 or 10%, that's a lot of people. But the other thing, the backstop we've got now, is that we've got these monoclonal antibodies. The one that survived Omicron, that works against Omicron, most of them have fallen by the wayside, but the one that still works is Sotrovimab. That's got to be given by an intravenous injection early, an intravenous drip early, like in the first five days after you get symptoms, but does prevent hospitalization and work quite effectively, but it's awkward to give. And now you've got two specific antiviral drugs, which are oral, so you can take them as a pill. I think it's twice or three times a day for five days. Um, so there's one called Paxlovid. I'm going into technical detail here because you might need this for the office situation and understand how it's, I think moving forward, it's important to understand what's around and, and, and so on. But it's two, one called Paxlovid and one called Molnupiravir. Paxlovid is uh, two drugs in one. Uh, it's an, there's an anti-HIV drug in there called ritonavir, and there's an anti-coronavirus drug. The ritonavir is in there not because it attacks coronavirus, but it distracts the body from metabolizing the coronavirus drug so that it stays at high levels and works better. So it's like a helper. The molnupiravir works by creating mutations in the virus and stopping it replicating. They're oral drugs. You've got to be able to take in the first five days like the antimonoclonal antibody after you get symptoms and it, it'll be the, so here's the caveats with these antivirals first of all they're not approved for for the pbs in other words a, a subsidized script so your doctor can't just write you out a script and you go and fill it in it's not been approved for that there's a medical stockpile and uh what's likely to happen it's not confirmed yet is that in each suburb, there might be one pharmacy that holds the stock of the antivirals. Your GP is going to have to do the tests, work out whether you've got, thinks you've got COVID and whether you qualify for COVID, and then um, and then write out, do, fill out forms and send you for that, for that pharmacy for the script. Paxlovid is probably going to take, is going to be the war horse here, the working uh, the, the, in, in this, because it's probably a bit better than the molnupiravir, but you've got the molnupiravir sitting there in the background, and the combination of the two might actually work quite well. And, uh, and they'll be free to begin with. Now, when new variants come along, uh, people who are immunocompromised, who've got who are elderly and frail, or who've got problems like diabetes and obesity and so on, those are the people who will be um, qualified, qualified for these drugs, as well as the unvaccinated. And they've been 
the, the trials have been in the unvaccinated population. So we're not absolutely sure how well they work in vaccinated people, but the assumption is that they will work quite well. So they're, they're there. So it's, there's an amazing range of technology and new vaccines coming along. Um, the, um, so fourth doses, you know, I think we'll be holding off on that. Masks, QR codes, social distancing, as we come off the top of this and we go to a dip over the next two weeks, Progressively, you'll see the mask mandate going. We're already seeing the QR code going in some states like Queensland. Um, and, but they'll need to be held in reserve because if there's a new variant coming along, you can't rely on the vaccine or the antivirals. We're going to have to go back to at least masks and QRs and just a, a, some semblance of, of control there. But we're not going to go back to lockdowns ever. And um, and we, sh you know, the prediction is we'll be fairly well protected moving forward from our level of vaccination. Um, there's really not much to stop people coming back to the office now. There's, you know, people have had the coronavirus. There's uh, the, the the frequency of it is coming down. Um, you, you, the mass mandate indoors helps with that the, the risk of spread. Um, and, I, and I think that. Um, Probably employers have just got to be attuned to the ventilation in their offices. I think they've got good air circulation. And you can buy one of these little CO2 monitors, which are not very expensive. And you can check the CO2 when people are in there. And if CO2 starts to go up, you know, you need to get your air conditioning people in or open a few windows or what have you to get a bit more air circulation in. And probably from about the 1st of March, there's really not a lot of reason for people to be working at home. They can come back into, into the office and we can go back to some semblance of, of normality. But we may move in, in and out of masks wearing, may move in and out of QR codes and so on, just to modulate the vaccine and help, and help us out there um, uh, 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 move forward. Certainly at Tonic, we are bringing people back on a a and B team pro process at the moment to get them used to it. Three days, two days, one week, two days, three days, the other in a well-ventilated office situation. Uh, we're giving them N95 masks so that they feel more secure. And um, we're not doing that much rat testing at this stage because uh, we're, we're asking people if they're symptomatic to stay at home. And I think from the 1st of March, we're going back to normal life. And we're assuming right about the 1st of March, vaccine mandate, the mask mandates will come off. Um, international borders have opened up uh, or are opening up in about two weeks time. We've got so much Omicron around that it should make very little difference to the Omicron. The difference it will make is that when new variants emerge overseas, they'll come in sooner. Um, but because they're going to be vaccinated, they, will, they should not be a burden to our healthcare system. If they get sick here, they, it's highly unlikely they're going to end up in hospital. Um, and I, I might, uh, you, you know, there's a question here about, you know, how do you keep staff and clients updated on this, um, we're certainly happy to provide these kinds of updates to you on a regular basis. You just need to let us know how often you, you want it and try and give you that information. My podcast, CoronaCast, is now three times a week and we try to actually give that sort of information so that you stay up to date um, with that. The ABC actually has a, a good COVID, um, a good COVID, um, we've got good, good COVID data so you want to see the data. The, uh, I know at least one health department that doesn't use the Commonwealth data, they use the ABC's COVID data. So the COVID dashboard for the ABC is pretty accurate. So I, I, I would recommend that. And there's some very good um, data analysts who are on Twitter. DB Raven, R-A-E-B-E-N is fantastic. Uh, Juliet O'Brien, um, just look at them on Twitter. They give, they're give they really good at giving you up-to-date data, but you get the analysis th through the ABC. Um, so I might stop there and um, and take your questions, have a conversation. And um, I noticed Nelly asked about, you know, Nelly asked about WA feeling. I mean, it's interesting. We have, we do webinars for, you know, for those of you who don't know about what Tonic is, we, we are out of, our largest health out of home uh, business media business in Australia, and one of one of our main um, out of home venues locations is in GP waiting rooms, very large audience, and we have a good relationship with GPs, a B two B relationship with the GPs, and we run GP webinars, and we did one the other day on 
um, give a good turnout. And we, we did the other one the other day on where we are now and what, how, what, what to do forward and so on. And the highest uptake was from GPs in Western Australia who are shitting themselves um, because they don't know what's coming in there, want to know what's happening in the East and how people are behaving. So once you've been shut, it's just nerve wracking to what will happen. Um, but it's got to happen at some point and it will come in. People will get sick. But if the booster rate is high, the impact should be. And, and of course, Western Australia is freshly immunized. Now is actually quite a good time for Western Australia to open up because with two doses relatively recently, you're still pretty well covered against infection. And there wasn't that much AstraZeneca used in Western Australia. So it's mostly Pfizer. So, so at the moment, it's pretty fresh. So we may well be making a mistake not opening this month, but um, who are we to say? Um, guys, I think we'll open it up to the floor. If you've got any questions, um, I'll just run through, through, through a few. Uh, Michael's asked, return to the office isn't necessarily a safety issue, but it's an issue of wearing masks. Understandably, people don't want to sit there with the masks on all day. So the question is, when will the mandates end for, for masks in the office, I guess? I, I think they're saying right about the 1st of March. 1st of March. Okay. And Nelly's question, um, I think it's been answered. Um, Janet's asked, uh, we work within a service um uh, service office environment is there a service office management legally responsible for co2 levels or... well there would be yes i mean it's not it's not a building standard unfortunately um and so you've got i, I mean I, th I think the pressure needs to be on people who are providing office space and if you're moving office i think ventilation has to become a criterion that you use to actually get the market to change um, I know people are interested in events and when you can go back to events and I'm, you know, I do a lot of speaking and the, uh, it's, it's, it's really interesting is that um, event locations, venues are acutely conscious of ventilation and they're starting to market themselves about you know, their, their ventilation rates, their air exchange rates and so on. And, um, and a lot of them have been interested in that anyway, because they reckon people get sleepy in environments where you've not got a high level of, uh, of exchange. But I think it's a, it's a question to ask in future about what level it is. I remember I did one, um, I did a gig in, uh, in the Blue Mountains in a, in a venue, I won't say which one. And luckily there was almost no virus around at that point, but I walked into this very stuffy room and I thought, shit, this is not a safe room. Um, but luckily there wasn't much virus around and they were organizing a second gig in Melbourne. And I said, well, you better just really have a talk to the venue. And they did, and you know, the venue responded very well. And this venue would have too, because there were other rooms which were better ventilated. They just, people just don't think about it. But we've got to be thinking of this in the future because there will be more pandemics and there'll be flu. And flu is less likely to circulate in an office that's well ventilated. Um, Penny's asked, uh, when will we need to stop worrying about number of staff in the office? Oh, I think that once the mask mandate is off, you don't have to worry anymore. I mean, I think that, um, once the, once there's no public health order on masks, that the social distancing drops. And that's when you, that's when you start to think about ventilation. So when you've got a full complement of people in the room, what's the CO2 level? I think 800 is the thing, is the, is the level and how close you're getting to that and what you need to do to actually um, keep that down low. But that's that's the key measure. And uh, Jackie's oh, asked- by, by the way, when, when you're in an office working with other people, the 1.5 meters makes almost no difference because once you've been in the same airspace as somebody, as, as other people for about an hour or so, you're breathing other people's air anyway. And you just want to be breathing as little of their air as possible. And socially distancing is not going to be, you do not catch, by and large, you don't catch, you know, obviously if I've got COVID and I cough over you, you can catch it. But that's actually not, the, that's, and you don't catch it off, you know, it's very rare to catch it off surfaces, off hands and so on. It's breathing other people's air. And so the social distancing, the 1.5 meters is important, but it's not a deal breaker. Yeah. What's your views on uh, rat testing employees as schools are returning, um, currently doing? Um, 
Well, rat testing is not as accurate as PCR. So many of you will already have seen that um, you've got symptoms or you're, you're, you're close contact and you're, you're rat negative, rat negative, rat negative, and then all of a sudden you're rat positive. And you'll know people who've gone out and get a PCR and then they've turned out PCR positive. The good thing about rats is that when, even though they're negative, um, it's likely that when they're negative, you're not infectious. And when they become positive, you are. And the PCR is very sensitive. So it picks up whether you've got the virus, but it's not good at telling you whether or not you're infectious. And so the value in the rat test is not its accuracy in finding out whether you're infected, it's its accuracy in finding out whether you're contagious at that moment. And it's repeated and a single rat test is of very little value because it's not that accurate. It's when you do one every day or two, that's when they start to become uh, accurate. Um, and, and so it's when you're positive. So if you've got symptoms, you're COVID positive regardless of what um, the rat test tells you. Mm. Um, in terms of, you know, the guys getting their staff back to the office, what are the, I guess, the main things that, that the leaders can do to make sure that from a duty of care that the, that, that the top things that they can do to, to get everyone back in the office in terms of keeping it, the environment safe? I think um, anecdotally, um, I'll come back to that Annette question on virus shedding in a minute. Uh, anecdotally, People, uh, workers are more concerned about being on public transport coming in than the office itself. So it's the process of getting to the office. So one thing that you could do is distribute N95s to staff, uh, which give you a very high level of immunity. And the, the key with N95s is that you buy a reliable brand. You look at the labeling and um, is it well printed? Does it feel substantial? Because there are lots of forgeries around. And, you know, does it have a good nose thing? And then, you know, if you're in the healthcare environment, you do fit testing, but with the, uh, you now the ear ones um, are called K95s. The Korean ones are, are it stands for Korea actually. Um, so the ear ones are not as good as the ones you tie behind your neck, but they're the, the most practical. And the best way to test them is to, Breathe in quickly and do you see the mask sucking in? And if you see the mask sucking in, it's a pretty good fit. And um, you could distribute them so that they feel a bit more secure um, on the way in. I mean, that, those are the most important things. And to show that you're actually thinking about the, the working environment, because that's a long-term thing, that you've got a safe working environment. So, so if the flu came along, you're working in an environment where you're very like, you're as likely to catch the flu from other people. Um, and, and going back to the flu, Penny's asked, uh, when, what do you think uh, the flu will be bad this year and should everyone get vaccinated for, for it? Well, the answer is yes, everybody should get vaccinated. Um, in 2019, I think there were 300,000 cases of influenza. In 2020, I think there were 500. So <laughs> it gives you an idea of how little flu there's been around. With kids, it's different actually, because kids are getting their respiratory virus, not flu, but they're getting respiratory viruses. And some kids are getting respiratory viruses plus COVID. It's really important kids get immunized. Um, so they're getting two infections at the one time. Um, and that's because kids are just, you know, you, kids are just much more social than we are and much more, you know, play together much more, much closely. So it could be a, a, a bad flu season. It's not showing any signs of that yet. Bad flu season usually starts to show up early. We're not seeing that at the moment. So it's likely to be a, a milder flu season, but who knows? But definitely staff should get immunized and, um, and workplaces should make that as easy as possible for people to get immunized against flu. <clears throat> when is the best time to get vaccinated for, for, for flu? Um, it, it, it's, well, it, it, it's pre-winter. And it's, um, I can't remember when it usually starts, but it's March, April, usually it kicks in. I think they've got the recipe this year already and they're manufacturing it, but I think it's March, April. I should know that because Tonic takes a lot of advertising for the flu, but it's right about that time. Okay. Yeah. 
Um, what is the virus shedding, shredding giving a positive rats test? Well, vi virus shedding is really when you are, that's when you are maximally contagious and you're throwing off virus and a lot of it. And the, the rat, the, the rat, what the rat test does is that it tests for the whole virus and it needs a fair bit of virus on it to register as positive. And, um, and so the, the very act of being pop, the very, you know, if the rat test is positive, it suggests you're shedding quite a lot of virus at that time. Um, a lot of the guys do international travel. Um, what are your thoughts on, on, I guess, them or their staff doing international travel, the, the, the likelihood of them being locked out um, of Australia? Is that all gone? I think so. I just don't think politically they can get away with it. There's now that we've got so much COVID around, there's just no rationale for doing it anymore. The one caveat in that is this, if a really nasty, horrible variant arises, which is resistant to the vaccine, what are they going to do? But I, I just don't think that's a, pardon me, a significant risk at this stage. I'm planning to go overseas twice in the next three months. Okay. Um, and this is probably, uh, guys, anyone else get, jump in with questions, but you know, one question that's on my mind that I, that I always like to that I think about is, is why some people catch, you know, uh, COVID and some some don't. I was with my children um, earlier this year. They both had COVID. We were living, breathing the same air. We avoided it. We had double, vac triple vaxxed. Uh, is the vaccine just proof that the vaccine works or is it T-cells or, or what, what stops some people from getting it and others getting it? Well, two or three reasons. It's mostly the, vac the vaccine. I actually twisted the arm of my local pharmacy and got a full dose of Moderna rather than a half dose as my third dose. Um, my arm regretted it for a few days, but the, um, so, so I, I, I've been in isolation with you know, a 14 year old and my partner who both had it and I didn't get it. Um, and I, I, I put that down to the booster and your level of immunity. Some people have a bit of natural immunity to, to COVID-19, but it's not very many, but um, there's always, there are always people in the, around who have some genetic mutation in their bodies that make them a bit resistant to infections. Even HIV, there's a small group of people who are resistant to HIV. And so it's a combination of factors. And it could just be that you're, <clears throat> they've only been infectious for a narrow window of time and you weren't breathing the same air for that moment. Um, Steve Fagans asks, can you get a second case of COVID and what's the percentage of likelihood? You can definitely get a second, so uh, unlikely to get a second dose of Omicron. So Omicron seems to immunize you pretty well against Omicron. So very unlikely, at least in the next few months. Can you be infected with another variant? 100%, yes. Um, if someone's got, got a staff member and, uh, and, they're, and they're not vaccinated due to health reasons, what, what what can they do to help support them so they don't feel isolated or you know th through the process yeah i think every workplace has got somebody like that um it's quite important not to stigmatize them uh, some of them are actually hanging out for novavax because they've got medical reasons for not getting pfizer so now that novavax is available i think you'll find there are fewer of those people who are not immunized uh, because a lot of people there are so there's not that many people in australia who are not immunized but of those who are, there's probably a significant percentage are just hanging out for Novavax. And I think you'll find that they will become immunized in the next you know, two or three months mm. um, for, for whatever reason. Some people, it's an irrational reason why they're waiting for Novavax, but some people have got a very good reason. I think it's important not to stigmatize them. And in an environment where you've got an immune evasion, evasive virus, there's less argument for insisting on a vaccine mandate, to be honest. I mean, I'm, I'm in favor of vaccine mandates. I think they're good things, but they're not terribly logical when you, so they're, they're important to prevent hospitalization. So they can go into hospital, take up a hospital bed needed by other people for other problems and they can die. And so they can be quite risky, you know, they're putting themselves at risk. But in terms of excluding them from the workplace, there's very little reason to do that anymore. Um, in terms of looking after them, well, um, they should probably wear an N95 for their own sake. Mm. Um, 
to so they don't pick up a virus and uh, so they're protecting themselves. I mean, that's that's the main thing. Um, but you know, if, if if somebody's made a choice based on freedom not to be vaccinated, um, rather than they've got a history of inflammation of the heart, they can't have Pfizer. If they if they if they made that decision, then you, you could take a hard line with them in terms of well, there's no reason for them to be working at home. They can come into the office. That's you know they've made a choice not to be vaccinated. They can they can come into the office and the office will respect them. They won't be isolated. We're not going to make you into a pariah, but you you need to come in. Is is there any and this is a, a question? Is is there any duty of care that that the leaders need to be aware of in terms of if they've got staff that are just do not want to return to the office and they don't feel safe doing so? You know, or probably the leaders don't want to be so forceful with them. But but is there a duty of care as as an employee? They they persuade them to come into the office or or if they just don't want to. I I I, um, I don't know the right answer to that question. I think every business is struggling with that. Some people really like the fact that they've worked from home and feel they do it quite well. Um, the duty of care is when you're when you're on lockdown, they have to work from home. And that gets you out of jail in many ways in terms of your duty of care of the home office. But if you're going to be much more permissive about working from home, then increasingly there's going to be an obligation of you to make on you to make sure that their home environment is actually safe. Um, and that's you know open you know open cords and so on, what happens when they trip. Um, these are the, these are difficult issues which we're only really just coming to to terms with. And I think that um, what's going to end where it's going to wash out is if you've got valuable employees that you don't want to lose and they're really committed to working from home and they like working from home and their product product increased productivity or good productivity, it's going to be, it's going to be hard ask to actually get them back in back into the office. The problem is that. Um, we all work in teams and teams are what makes us strong and diverse and able to adapt and it's hard to create teams in a virtual environment. Mm. Um, Dom Pearman's put his hand up. Dom, do you want to ask a question? Yeah, thanks Norman. A um, couple of questions. Uh, Roy Morgan came out the other day and I suppose I'm looking at this because to run a business you probably have to be a fairly uh, an optimist to begin with anyway but Roy Morgan's come out and basically said that that over the last two years, we've had 13,000 less deaths from all causes. Um, so my question is, yeah, are we, is this a good thing? <laughs> because, you know, less people are dying of flu or whatever it is, but there's 13,000 less deaths. And the second question was, I guess it's the public transport fear that, that employees have. And it sounds like your advice is to give them N95 masks. Yeah, for the time being until there's very little bar. I think once there's a lull, and there's very little, just ask the second, taking the second one first. Once there's a lull, and that lull is going to come quite soon, they're not going to see big hospital statistics. There's not going to be that many deaths. That will eventually go down. I think that there will be less and less nervousness about being, about being on a train. But for the next month or so, that, that might well be a, a good solution for you. In terms of excess deaths, controversial. Um, but, and it's not entirely clear. So the, the excess deaths go across the board, fewer traffic accidents, fewer deaths from uh, influenza. Um, it'll be interesting to see what the excess deaths look like for the first three months of this year with the number of deaths that, that we've had, even though it's small compared to the, the, the background daily, uh, daily death rate. Um, but there'll be a, a variety of reasons, fewer respiratory infections and so on. But there's going to be a long tail. There's a, there's a tail of uh, people who got late cancer diagnosis. Mm. Um, and that will be a tail that you'll see for four, five, six, seven, eight years. Um, there's a tail of people with uh, chronic cardiac conditions and diabetes that's not been well managed. So these people like that don't die early, they die late. And you, you probably need to take about a five-year frame on this to see the true impact of this pandemic over time. Mm. Um, and, you know, in terms of 
mentioned mental health and and, and obviously everyone uh, you know no one's immune from, from from that over the past two years any advice to staff struggling with with returning back to the office or from a, from a mental health point of view yeah i mean i think that go, that's going to Dominic's question and, and others is that there's an anxiety level and there's a lot of psychological distress particularly in younger people and this is an industry uh, that biases towards younger people, to millennials and younger. And uh, there's a lot of psychological distress in that community. And for those of us who are parents of younger people, um, if we, who are particularly going through the education system, they, they've really done it tough, particularly those who have gone to university or college and really never been into a classroom. Uh, so the psychological distress is a combination of depression and anxiety. And there's a lot around and anything you add to that can heighten that background level of psychological distress. So I think it's about um, acknowledging that that's there. I think um, we've been doing a little bit of this is um, with some clients is what we is actually having sessions on this. Um, drug and alcohol is a very bad idea when you're when you've got high background levels of psychological distress. So, and people sometimes treat that with uh, alcohol in particular. Now, younger people tend to be a group that aren't smoking as much and aren't drinking as much as, um, as my age group did or does. Um, so they're already in a good, good shape there. But I think you've got to be careful about Friday night drinks. Um, I, think, I think that there are pr probably education sessions on that would help in, the, in, in your office environment. We'd be happy to put on something for you if you wanted. Um, we've done a couple of webinars on just this topic for the advertising industry, and we would be happy to talk about doing another one for you, which just talks through some of the psychological strategies that you can employ to just ease people back into normal living. Because when you're at a heightened level, I'm repeating myself a little bit, but the, the, the science of this is when you're at a heightened level of psychological distress, you don't need to add very much to tip people over. Um, so you've got to kind of help to get people down and self-managing. And there are various techniques for doing that. So if that's of interest to either yeah. MAA, um, Tony would be happy to try and organize something for you that you might invite your employees to. So it wouldn't be just for CEOs. IMAA could host something that would be for employees as well. That sounds fantastic. Um, final question. Um, you know, if your prediction for how this year is going to play out, um, if you're a betting man, how, how's the year going to, are we going to have another variant? Uh, what do you think is going to happen? I'll just answer Simon's question there. It's welcome back drinks. It's, it's, it's okay, but um, I, th I think you just, and I think a lot of workplaces are already tuned into this, is that, um, you know, I'd be offering light beer. I'd be just showing a little, you know, it, it, I wouldn't be having bucket loads of mud or of, you know, lying around. You'd be sparing and careful. It wouldn't, so I'm not saying go back to no alcohol. It's just, just be sensible about it. Um, and, and a lot of employers, particularly in this industry, in our industry, like to be seen to be generous and the things are overflowing and you've got great fridges in the office and you're going to help with it. Yeah, focus on the food and the nice coffee machine. And if you've got welcome drinks, just don't have you know, bottles everywhere lying around. To, to so how do I see this year playing out? I think there will be another variant, hopefully only one, but there may be two. I think that we'll handle it pretty well. And um, as long as we maintain vaccination, uh, vaccination rates, we'll learn how to use the antivirals. I think we'll see more international travel and I think in countries will just become that little bit less nervous. I think that uh, when our general election is over and uh, the current government returned or a new government put in, I think a lot of that uh, political anxiety will settle down and you might get more coherent policies. But we haven't had very coherent policies at the moment and the, the government's been a bit coltish about this as have some of the state governments. I think they're just, we need, politics cause pandemics, by the way, you know, much more, I gave this talk before, and politics can make things worse and they can make things better. And so 
how politicians respond is going to be very important and where they are in the election cycle. But I think we'll be okay. I, I think it will be rough at times, but I think we'll be okay. Um, one more question as well from Nelly. We've got, uh, can we expect uh, a yearly booster moving forward? Um, almost certainly yes, and possibly combined with the flu. Novavax has, uh, is working on a combined flu COVID-19 vaccine. Um, the problem with that is that it's too early for that at the moment because too many new variants are spinning off because we haven't immunized low-income countries. When we've immunized low-income countries and we slow the whole virus down, then you get to the stage we get to with influenza, which is it becomes relatively predictable. But as we know, um, with flu, we had a very bad flu season, I think 2018, 2019, because they got the prediction wrong. And you can still get a flu pandemic, by the way, big jump. So, it, but it does become more predictable. And it may take two years for it to become sufficiently predictable that you could have a useful vaccine every year. Mm. Excellent. Thank you um, so much, Dr. Norman on behalf of all the members. It's fascinating. We could probably annoy you for the rest of your day uh, asking questions. It's fascinating. Uh, and, and there's a bit of comfort there that life is returning to normal and, and, and this isn't the end of day. So thank you for, so much for your support uh, from a tonic health point of view and also providing the insights. We would love to hear uh, and, and we'll work with Sev on, on, on bringing um, the way that um, uh, the mental health chat comes to life, um, but would love to work with you on that. Thank you again. Thank you, members, uh, for tuning in, and um, and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you, Norman. Appreciate it. Most welcome. It's been my pleasure. See you guys.